You know, I've been in the 45 game for a long time because um, I always loved 45 since a kid. So that that's a whole other animal right there because the 45 game is, is, is really local. It's about states. Each state has local bands that recorded stuff and a lot of those records are really rare. A lot of the stuff that I would play today can go from anywhere from $50 to $2,000 for 45, 3000 you know what I mean? Because there's maybe five more copies in the world. So, you know, um, we take this very, you know, it's not taken lightly, you know what I mean? Definitely know that I heard of how big your collection is. <laughs> You guys seen that, anything to ask a little bit on your uh, As far as the DITC, the formation of that, the members, was that something from when y'all was like late teens? Where did that all start from? You guys just all living in the same areas and with networking? DITC started, I say, around the time Lord asked me to record his first album. I said, you know, I'm technician. We already knew each other when they asked me to be on. As the just came up here, and I was like, so we had a show. And then, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. From there, everything kind of branched off. Um, but that's where it started. Lord Vanessa first uh, was a technician. Fat Joe, Grand Pooper, Diamond D, Time to Make the Dough. That was a great album. Yeah, Watch the Sound was a, a classic record for me. As far as like the, the little reggae hooks on it, I was, I was feeling that bottom of the reggae head. And as far as for Kenny, the, uh, the Screechy Dan collaboration, how did that come about? That's a record I have and I've always loved. I really like that record. I was wondering about that. Okay, we'll be a little bit. Before that, I was fusing hip hop and reggae together. Right. You know, um, because at that time, the club was about playing good music. It didn't matter what it was. You wanted to make people dance. At that period, there was Junior Reed had a, a joint called One Blood, which I, I fused with with Tribe's joint. It was called Blood Vibes, and then you know I kept fusing these records. So I did a, a, a record. I was doing a record, actually recording a record for free records um, called The Unreleased Project. It was mainly all beats. Now, I wanted to record something with an artist, you know what I'm saying? And um, Todd Terry was linked to Screechy Dan and got them in and did that, you know what I'm saying? But I also, before that, I had did, I had used Screechy on the record, but I, had, I was out of pocket with him. So Todd actually brought him in and, and, and we laid that down. Nice. I thought that was a good record. Good collaboration. So a question for Kenny. Donald's a lot of house music besides hip hop. I was wondering, how did you and Louis Vega get together for a master's out of work? Well, pretty much um, during, I would say like 89, 88, 89, um, I was starting to get my feet wet in production and, and, and doing records and stuff. And being, Todd used to come to my parties in Brooklyn. That crew, used to be called Masters at Work. Todd at that point was doing records. I wasn't doing records yet. We were just like a sound system, you know, and doing parties. He had borrowed the name to make Dumb Dumb Cry and this record call all right, all right. In the mix of that, I was doing my stuff and then he brought a record to Louie, who was playing at Roseland at the time. And Louie wanted to remix my song. He wanted to, you know, mess with it or whatever. The remix never happened, but the partnership started from that point, and we've done tons after that. You know what I mean? It was it was a crazy run from '90 all the way to like 2000, pretty much. You know, pretty much mixed everybody, from the Madonnas to the Janets to the Michaels to everybody. You know, pretty much. And 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 at that point, from doing those mixes, um, we wanted to take things to another level. And in '97, we did a record called New Eureka Soul. Um, where, you know, we got to a point where we wanted to bring in live instrumentation, live bass player, percussionist, drummers, and, and then we worked with Roy Ayers, we also worked with George Benson. We did um, Vince Montana, 
to your point that Eddie Paul married, you know, so it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. So, and that's where I got my feet wet working with vocalists and, and all that. And that's what we're doing today. Got anything to add, Glenn, on that? Uh, as far as, let's get to like the current state of things, as far as uh, the last year, releases that you guys have put out, the record you just gave me tonight, Kenny, maybe you want to talk about that record a little bit, where those musicians came from, how that formulated. I'm waiting to hear that thing. Well, a lot of, the, a lot of musicians on the Fantastic Souls are from my sessions that I've done mixes over the last five, six years. Musicians, um, so I put them together. And just kind of, since I have the KD label, which is primarily soul and funk, I wanted to do a new band like that. You know, a lot of people don't know, but I kind of started that tone, who, you know, I was behind them and, and gave them a push to get their stuff out there, they're all over the place now. So I kind of wanted to do my own thing, get my own band together, take my own band out, and that's what that, that is. And, and that's what we're doing, I did a whole album, um, there's some e-boy stuff on there, there's, there's Latin tracks on there, there's some real dope, deep soul funk joints on there, so that's coming at the end of the year, pretty much. That's great. Looking forward to that. Hey, you guys still pressing vinyl on all the stuff? Absolutely. Yeah, we're still doing the vinyl, um, because it's, it's the root of it all, and a lot of the kids even are getting into it, you know what I mean? They, they want to collect it, they want to feel the record, they want to look at the labels, they want to read liner notes. So um, I'm full blast with that, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a purist, I'm into the wax, and I want to keep it going, and it's been working, you know? So, definitely. Uh, so a question for Kenny and Diamond. How have you seen marketing yourself as an artist, how has it changed in the past 20 years to now, especially now with the digital age where anyone can download songs and all that. How do you guys deal with that kind of new marketing? I'm going to tell you one thing. I, I wasn't a fan of Facebook um, and all that. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, like the last month, I've been really hitting Twitter hard and Facebook hard. Because I've been, I got a lot of different kind of records out. I got house records out right now. I got the soul and funk records out right now. And I'm pushing my artist, who's a, who's an MC, who we did a, a whole underground hip hop album. So it's like everything's working each other, going backwards, intertwined. You know, you got house people wanting to know what the hip hop is. You got the hip hop people wanting to know. So it, it's it's just at the end of the day, the way I'm seeing it is all about good music. So that's what we push it forward, and that's what I've been doing, and it's, and it's been crazy. The reaction has been crazy. So it's we didn't have it ten years ago, you know, or twenty years ago when we started. We had record stores. The record stores were the, where you went to to get the vibe and talk to people and to talk to the, to the you know, and know what was coming out and stuff like that. Now we have the social networking thing that we can reach so many people on one tweet. You know what I mean? That's crazy. You know what I mean? We, we talk online, we, we post up 45s online. You know, it's just crazy and it, it is fun. But at the same time, we're reaching so many people that we never could reach before. And I think that's that's great. You know what I mean? It's just use it to, to, to what we need to do. Right. Do you miss the, uh, you guys miss the whole element of being able to go to a record shop and network with everybody because it was the only place to get these things versus just sending it on the internet, which is good. The energy and the way people go about getting the stuff nowadays, like missing their personal side of things. Unless you're really in Absolutely, I definitely miss the stores. You know, in New York, there's, there's, there's like five stores. Right? Meanwhile, in New York, it used to be like 50. You know, um, I, I came from that record store environment. I worked in a record store before. Right. I was the buyer of a record store. You know what I mean? That's where my ear is so crazy when I hear records because. I had to buy the right records to sell the right to sell the records that are not going to sit on the shelf. Right. You know what I'm saying? So um, I definitely miss it. But the part that I miss, it picks up on us digging right. and digging for records. You know what I'm saying? We walk, we walk, we walk back from the hotel. I mean, from here actually to the hotel, and we found a little store on the corner. Right. Which is crazy. We just walked in and it was nice for us, but you know, it, it's just the whole.
over there. The smell of it, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the covers and we're like flipping around like a bunch of little kids, you know? That's that's all about. That's what it's about. Absolutely. It's great. Okay. Basically, can he just answer the same thing? Well, I would have said more or less. So I just can't ask him another question. <laughs> All right, so. <clears throat> Could you describe the feeling you had when you first, your first record? Your first record that you ever heard? First record you bought? What was that what kind of, what was that feeling? Describe that feeling you got with you. Know, you uh, first record album. What was it? Was um a record called Shang Shangri La. Uh, it's like a it's like a famous break me. Well, that, that was the first record I bought on my own. Prior to that, my mom would like bring home forty fives to me or whatever. But um, I never forget like you know like. Like now, I, I wouldn't even walk that far. It, 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 was, it was a pretty long walk. Maybe about like, like, a, like a 40 minute walk. I mean, I lived to the store, but I would walk over there all the time. I didn't know as a child. That, that was a pretty good job for Shane to ride. You know? and, um, I still had it. You know what I mean? So I just treasure that. This guy right here, he has it on, he has it on 45 right here. Actually, the first record I bought was uh, Super Rhymes, Jimmy Spicer. I just couldn't get over how he was just rhyming and rhyming and rhyming and rhyming <laughs> for like 15, 15 minutes straight, you know. That was the first joint I bought, and, and yeah, it started from there, you know, it was just, it was just crazy. Anything to add for it? As far as your band thing, have you played the instruments? Or you ever plan on taking that band and do, do you guys do shows with the band too? Or you do want to take them off? I think that would be a nice move. Yeah, pretty much we got four horns, drums, bass, guitar, percussion. It's full. Nice. It's full piece, you know, it's strong. Yeah, that would be nice to see someday. So as far as current projects, Diamond, do you have any uh, current things working? Single with Farrah Monch's new album entitled War. The single is called Shine. And um, I just did something to break on that I'm, I'm really excited about. Uh, other than that, uh, I'm going to do an album where I just produce everything and just have different MCs on it. Just going to stay behind the boards for a minute, just get some of this music that I've been holding on for me out, out to the public. Yeah, I also got to join the Ray Corn album. Um, featuring Method Man and Raheem Devon. It's going from the hills. And I also got to join on a new Joel Ortiz album called Free Agent. And what I saw was called Finish with your Star. Yep. So we, we're, we're dabbing in the music, all types. <laughs> Fresh. When's the last time you actually rocked, rocked the show as an MC? Like when, that, when, you pers when you put out stunts, blunts, and hip hop, was that something you toyed with and actually were an MC full? Time more than the producer? Yeah, like I, I was doing both. I, um, I, I did an MC set um, last month. Um, you know, I, I still do. You know, I, you know it, it depends on whatever the promoter, you know, some promoters hire me to MC, some hire me to DJ, so it's like, you know, whatever. 